Okay, hi Jim, uh, welcome. Very nice to um, have you here with this with us today. Uh, we're super grateful that you took some time and um, um, yeah, good to have you in the Netherlands <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> virtually. Yeah. Um, would you? Oh, yes. I wish I was with you physically, as uh, you're, you know, as I'm very very fond of the Netherlands and have had a number of wonderful experiences there as well as it's wonderful that you're one of the sane countries. Um, as you know, mine is not at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully yeah. there will be an encounter uh, uh, sometime soon uh, here <laughs> in this area. Would be so lovely. Um, would you quickly uh, introduce yourself very briefly to the audience and um, perhaps also give your account on where the idea of microdosing originally comes from? Because there are maybe some theories about it, and it would be nice to have your take on this as well. Well, um, my name is James Fadiman, and I've been involved in psychedelics for um, longer than any of us wish to even imagine, uh, but back when it was legal as well. Um, and I couldn't have been more disinterested in small doses. My own work was with very high doses, looking for transcendent experiences, uh, breakthroughs, mystical uh, realizations that, you know, we are not born, nor do we die, um, that kind of experience. And here I am uh, at the other end of the scale working with 10 micrograms and less, uh, or one tenth of a gram of, of psilocybin mushrooms. And that happened because a friend of mine mentioned that uh, Robert Fort mentioned that Albert Hoffman had told him about that very low doses were valuable. And I got curious and started asking friends, would they be interested in trying a very low dose? And the reports were positive, and I've been researching them now for the past uh, eight or nine years. Yeah, right. And, and while there wasn't anything in the, in the LSD and um, psychedelic literature, the science literature about low doses, of course, uh, they've been used in, by indigenous people uh, for thousands of years yeah. because they uh, are helpful. They add to alertness. If you're a hunter, uh, imagine that if you're a hunter, you want to be able to notice a little bit better. You want to be a little bit more agile. Um, yeah. And you also want to be able to, uh, to see at a little greater distance. So, of course, these were used both uh, for healthy people and, and probably for illness as well. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you know? Do you know if there's any more information on that, like the, those well, different types of uses, ancient? Um, we have not much. Uh, one of my friends mm -hmm. did an anthropological research, and there's something in the uh, in the early um, when the Spanish uh, destroyed Mexico. Um, several of the Jesuits went and interviewed everyone they could about their the way they lived before the Spanish came. Mm -hmm. and so there's. Mm -hmm. There are descriptions of how people use mushrooms, um, but it isn't clear because nobody had any any notion of, of doses. Yeah. No. Yeah. Anthropologists tend not to ask about you know what's normal. They don't say, uh, "Oh, you eat radishes." Yeah. Um, is that is that a religious system that you're in? And they say, "No, it's a radish." Yeah. 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 And maybe it was just a superfood at the time, or just one of the. Well, many foods they found and ate. Uh, was doing early research in, in Costa Rica and she was talking to the to the to the shamans and to the, the, the healers about what plants they used. And then she was talking with some women and the women said, you know, we have our plants as well. Mm. Okay. And all of a sudden a lot of the anthropology literature suddenly looked like it was only talking to half of the of the of the you know, of the plant physicians in, in, the, in the group. So, so there's lots we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Because these substances clearly are helpful at very low doses, it's hard to imagine that people are not using them. And uh, another anthropologist yeah. said, mm -hmm. of course they would have tried every possible dose. And then he mentioned that he personally uh, takes a microdose of psilocybin if he feels that he has a cold coming on mm. and he has not had a cold for 15 years. Yeah. Ah, right, right. 
Yeah. yeah, there are also, yeah. also some evidence of the rituals uh, who you're using uh, uh, San Pedro or peyote in the ceremonies. And then also the women or the children even, they use a very small amount also during that ceremony. So, and, and also... Yeah. And even now the ayahuasca churches in Brazil, children are part of the ceremony and are given a small amount. Yeah. And there, there was some research done that the children, uh, the kind of ayahuasca children, of the religion uh, were doing very well in school. They were healthier. They were basically um, doing splendidly um, by also having ayahuasca as part of their, uh, part of what they did on a weekly basis. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, and um, your research that was uh, just published now in April, I think yeah. that um, the, it's an, it's an exploration, you call it an exploration into microdosing. Um, and there were a thousand subjects, the data from a thousand subjects, people who microdosed, um, and we can read all the, all the articles, uh, it was pretty much in the, in the media that, um, the findings were relief from depression, um, uh, better mood, uh, more effectivity in working productivity and healthy habits, uh, things like that, that, yeah, came, yeah came out of this uh, of this exploration um, can you um, yeah can you say a bit more about those findings and particularly what surprised you yeah. well um, we basically said to people if you want to microdose fine we can't determine anything about your past until you tell us mm -hmm. and if it's not working for you if it's anything difficult stop mm -hmm. And what we found is many, many of, the, of, our, of our subjects from 51 countries, um, maybe half of them uh, were concerned about depression. And almost all of those people had had antidepressants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so people who were called in the literature treatment resistant, uh, which is a mean term because it's like their fault. Yeah. Uh, what it means is that, my, that uh, antidepressants are not terribly helpful to a large percentage very, very high percentage of those people, maybe 80%, reported that they not only were not depressed, um, meaning antidepressants, when they work at all, they make you feel less bad yeah. about your situation. Yeah. And the people complain about them, say, yes, I feel less bad, but I also feel numb about it. Yeah. Emotionally yeah. numb, yeah. So that's a successful antidepressant. What yeah. we found is people on microdosing, not only did they have less negative feelings, but they also had an up in positive feelings. Yeah. So they felt less bad and more good. And that's yeah. a very different situation. So yeah. they, what they'd say is, oh, I feel like myself again. Um, yeah. I'm enjoying life. Um, I'm much nicer I, I like to play with my kids yeah. yeah more empathy yeah so they were not only not depressed but they were basically yeah. functioning in a way that they appreciated and that was that's the kind of big major and yeah. we pretty much did expect that because uh in the years before we were more formal i was getting really hundreds of reports yeah mm -hmm. um, and that was not uncommon the other group who were not depressed and just were taking it for other interests, they basically more often would report um, improved sleep and then what was, uh, and, and things that they hadn't intended, meaning they were often wanting to be more creative or more energetic. But what we saw again and again and again is they'd say, gee, I'm eating better. I'm eating more healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite was the guy who read, who was on, very serious junk food guy uh -huh. and wrote at one point my god i looked at the menu and i wanted the salad yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And what we yeah. had is people were using less coffee less yeah. coffee, less mm. marijuana um, yeah. and less of pharmaceuticals yeah. so um, that's an that's a very interesting yeah. finding of a very different sort because people weren't taking microdosing intending any of that yeah. yeah i was gonna ask about it like the role of expectation because for someone who's depressed 
they may have some sort of expectation. Oh, could this help me? Could this yeah. make me feel better? But when you talk about like a change of habits or uh, just drinking less coffee, um, I don't know if this is something that we're people aiming for. Yeah. How there was just a little. What we know about the, the placebo or the natural healing effect is expectation is very important. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of ways you can manipulate that. But, yeah. but in a sense, with, with our work, with people taking it on their own, in their own country, in their own time, they didn't get all of the push that, that placebo studies use. Yeah. And so what we were clearly seeing, particularly in things they hadn't intended, um, is something, something going on that's more fundamental. And when mm -hmm. we look at some of, and your question, of what surprised us, what's, those are all mental issues in a sense. What surprised us were some serious changes in important physical uh, problems that yeah. never occurred to us and again don't exist in the larger psychedelic literature. And the, the most striking uh, woman in London wrote me and said, I owe you a report, but maybe this would interest you. And she said, during the month I microdosed, my period, which has always been painful and crampy, was normal. Mm. That's very yeah. big. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I wrote her back, Mr. Science, you know, what, how much did you take? How often did you take it? What are you doing every month? And she wrote back, she said, I only took it during that one month. My periods are now normal. They'd never been normal in her life. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Periods are now normal. Thank you very much. You have changed my life. <laughs> yeah, that's really and interesting. So with Sophia, who is in, really runs the whole data part of our operation, I just do the talking. <laughs> um, we have a, a group of, of eight or ten women now who have reported improvements in, uh, in their periods, both emotional and physical. And yeah. so we've asked a, a researcher in that area, would they like to take this data and, and do what they wish. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of our goal. We do exploring, which we do discovering. Yeah. We don't do the kind of hard science that the scientific community both does better and, um, and can afford, basically. Yeah. So these studies are expensive when you do them the hard way. And that's also the, your ex explanation that you are searching instead of researching. Then you keep it the, the whole holistic, uh, yeah, you, you're just observing what people uh, experience, yeah. The image is we've discovered this island and it has trees and it has fish and it has animals and it has plants and it has minerals and nobody's been there. Yeah. 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 And so we're saying over there it looks like something is glittering, it might be rubies, it might be nothing. Over here is trees and they have these funny shaped fruits and they taste pretty good. And there's some wonderful, cute little animals. <laughs> and then yeah. the other people arrive and the animal specialist comes and the, yeah, yeah. the tree specialist comes and the mineral specialist comes and they do the next level of work, um, which is what they're good at and which we're not. And so yeah. Yeah. great metaphor. Yeah. Our goal is to have everybody take our data yeah. and, and let us do other things. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Have, have oh. these projects started already? These follow-up uh, specify studies, like can you well, mention yeah, what what's going, going on? on in history, not right now, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, and there's a group in Canada um, starting who are, who they said, we're funded, we're ready, we're now just looking for the psilocybin. Um, there was a study in Australia, there's a study starting in New Zealand uh, with uh, a psychiatrist and the local medical community, a university psychiatrist and the local medical community. Um, so the next level of work is 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 starting up, and we're yeah. very relieved to see it happening. Yeah. yeah. And of course, there um, there's the endless stream of media articles of people reporting both their personal work and compiling the bits of research there are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So which, which questions do you wish to see answered through further microdosing research? Well, the... Just pick two <laughs> or three or <laughs> it's probably many. <laughs> In a sense, the one that's most um, easiest to answer is depression, both because mm -hmm. it's 
very easy to get subjects and it's easy to find out if they feel better. Now there's a difference between what's called statistical significance, which means actually of no importance at all, and what's called clinical significance, which is, do you feel better? Yeah. You know, so if, if, I'm, if I'm taking something for pain and my pain is at eight, yeah. and my pain is now at 7.8, yeah. that's statistically significant, but who cares? Yeah. But if my pain is at four, that's called clinically significant, and I'm gonna want more of that medication. Yeah. So I, yeah. Those are the studies that interest me. Yeah. The ones that are the most, uh, the kind of uh, edgy ones, and here's another surprising one. Um, there's, a, there's something called shingles. I don't know if it's the same word. Shingles is a, um, when you've had chicken pox as a child, as yeah. an older adult, the same um, virus is still in your system and as an adult, it usually is painful in the mid part of your body. And it's, it's, it's older people. And if you catch it in time, there's something you can take for most people. It's un, it itches and it's a little uncomfortable. For a certain percentage, it's terrible. It has rashes, it has mm -hmm. intense pain. And if you look into what does the medical profession do for it, there are 10 different things they do, all different, which means they haven't solved it at all. Yeah. We have, I, I had a, a note from someone um, from the middle of Africa who had no psychedelic experience, had three months of shingles pain. He could no longer sleep because of pain. And he said, I had a friend in the capital who had a mushroom and I thought it might be a good idea. 45 minutes later, he's out of pain. All right. Wow. He stays there. Yeah. And so I could hardly wait to tell Sophia this okay. at the international conference. And so I told her, you know, big, exciting discovery. And she said, huh, two people at the conference came up and threw their arms around me and cried and wow. thanked me for our work because of their husband's shingles. Ah, wow. Okay. Wow. So this is a new area to explore. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Because it has nothing to do with you know uh, receptor 52a in the brain where all that research talks about yeah yeah yeah, yeah. this is totally different thing uh, right. yeah right and I, I was talking with my cardiologist a few days ago about it about various things and then and he was interested and i said shingles and his eyebrows whoop, whoop. oh my gosh yeah <laughs> he understood that's a totally different pathway that's a virus and so forth so the question yeah. of how does that work and the other yeah. one that's very exciting is, well, two. One is traumatic brain injury. Hmm. Traumatic brain hmm. injury, when you have it, there's various things they do for a while, for a year, maybe two years. We've had several people who basically came up to me at conferences and said, after all the therapy was over, I had various symptoms, predominantly painful headaches. And when I microdosed, those symptoms went away. Wow. So that's another area to look yeah. at. And we, have, we also have a, a very serious and well-researched one case of someone who had a stroke, major stroke, at, at age, I think, like 70. And this was now seven years later. And he was stable and not happy. He had been a traveling musician, and he never stopped traveling. <laughs> and his physician said he was better he felt he was better he was more social he stopped drinking as much and after a couple of weeks he said to his wife uh, they live in California he said I'd like to visit friends in Mexico now remember he hasn't wanted to go anywhere and she said well that's wonderful but I'm busy for a couple of weeks he said that's okay I'll go on my own so a little bit scary, but he traveled to Mexico and he's with friends and he's still microdosing. And then she said, she wrote me and said, I just spoke to him. And for the first time in many years, he says, I'm no longer using my cane. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, all special, yeah. uh, special stories. Special cases. Yeah. Well, yeah. For the... and that's the way I'm working, which is that's explore, exploration. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. that's be, well, it, it could have been a placebo. The answer is fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just have more people try it and then try to create this 
uh, this link between the medical world and yeah, people okay. sh com coming uh, to the surface with their with their results and trying probably to get it into the the media yeah. and get it out there in the world so that really uh, some research can can take place here. That's one yeah. person wrote us. He said, uh, "I don't care if it's a placebo. I haven't felt this good in decades." <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, that's yeah. a good a good end because we we uh, we run out of time for uh, for uh, the time for the seminar uh, event. The seminar. What would thank you for inviting me? What would you like to say to the audience audience uh, as a last tip for microdosing, or uh, what would you be smart, say to them? be safe, and if you'll keep records, I would be very appreciative. Okay, thank <laughs> you very much. That is a good. Uh, thank ending. you very much.